I advocate for a slow transition. It's you know, don't just leave your job and say I'm I'm now going to start from zero and whatever. Make a, a slow transition yeah. and first prove because sometimes you think you want to do something else, but you're going to hate that other thing as much as you hate this thing that you're doing right now. Hello, hi, I am Nobu Kumalo and welcome to Seasons, a series where I sit down with some of the most incredible people I've had the privilege of rubbing shoulders with. And we have conversations about, you know, the different seasons of life in the hopes that you will feel um, seen, that you relate and you know that you're not alone. So welcome and um, I hope you enjoy. Today on my uh, chair, on the chair in front of me, I have genuinely uh, one of the most incredible humans I've ever met. He is a lover of art in many forms. He paints, he draws, he writes. Uh, sometimes used to, you know, um, podcast in his former life. <laughs> he is an introvert, but also who really, really loves people and is a person who really genuinely enjoys, you know, just learning. He's, uh, you know, a student of life. But bigger than that, I have seen him reinvent himself many times uh, from moving from being a civil engineer, which is what he studied in university, to becoming a GIS um, specialist, self-taught, and then now is a software developer, also um, self-taught. But amongst you know the many accolades and, and all those things that he has, I think the title that he holds dear to his heart is the one that um, you know he so happens to be my husband. <laughs> um, so I have my husband here, Begani Kumalo, fondly known as BK, on my chair today. Hi. Hello. How are you doing? I'm doing good. You're doing good? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's good. It's good to have you here, man. I mean, I've had you here before, of course, but in a different format and not in this, you know, serious setup. So I'm gonna, you know, have some <laughs> icebreakers. I don't think there's ice between us, but <laughs> I'm just gonna break the ice anyway. So the first icebreaker for that I have for you is: if money wasn't a problem, right, what mm-hmm. would you do with your life? Probably the same thing I'm doing now. Oh wow! <laughs> so so you good? So you're good? Yeah, you're happy. You're content. Yeah, I'd, I'd be doing the same thing, not not doing it for somebody else. Okay, okay, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. And what's your favorite way to unwind after, you know, a crazy, busy day? Um, probably watch something. Mm-hmm. Um, I watch a lot of YouTube. So um, a lot of times I, I watch educational stuff. But if it's unwinding, then I'd probably be watching tech reviews. Okay. Or I don't know comedy skits, the comedy skits that you you don't like. <laughs> okay, okay, that's that's fair enough. And then mm. the, the last one that I have for you is that you like you like animation and you also like you know Marvel and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Like if you were to hang out with one character from any of the many you know animation, sci-fi, whatever shows um, you watch, what character would that be and why? A fictional character. Yeah, or? A fictional character. That's a that's an interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> Top of mind, what comes to mind? Um, Iron Man. Okay. Uh, th- that's top of mind. It's not very well thought out. Yeah. Why? But uh, he's an incredible guy. Uh-huh. Um, he's flawed. Yeah. Like a lot of people, but he he cares. Okay. You know, at the end of the day, he he cares. Uh-huh. Um. Is the typical, you know, like Batman, billionaire, playboy type person. Yeah. But at the end of the day, he, he cares about the world. He cares about humanity. Yeah. And so despite his flaws, um, you know, he's a caring guy and he's like the leader of the team. Okay. Good enough. I'll take it. I'll take <laughs> it. So fine. Let, let's get into it. So for as long as I've known you, you've always been a guy who knows Everything about everything. I always say this to you. When I ask you something, you're like, I don't know. I'm always like, how do you not know? You're supposed to be like, you know everything. And I remember when we started talking like over 10 years ago, I remember we, we spent a lot of our time talking about poetry, right? And I think that's where it kind of dawned on me that this guy is just an avid reader and then, you know, a person just loves learning. But I'm, I'm curious to know where that came from. So tell me about your childhood. Like, what type of a setup did you did you grow grow up in? Was reading like the norm? Where did you pick that up from? Is it something that's just, you know, we're all just readers in the family, so you also picked it up? Or where, where did that come from? 
Wow. How much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> um, interestingly, I, I didn't grow up as a reader. Okay. Um, but I, I, I grew up as somebody who was really curious. Okay. So right. it's not like I've always been a reader. Because I've spoken to people who, who are readers who tell you, you know, growing up, I read a lot of novels or read whatever, right? Yeah. So for me, it wasn't so much that I loved reading, but I loved learning. Okay. Um, getting to know about new things. And at home, my mom has been a reader. Okay. Um, you know, but she reads novels and mm-hmm. things like mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. And so that's why I can draw that con- contrast that I wasn't so much of a, of a, of a reader. Of a reader, uh-huh. But I've always been really curious. Okay. Um, I think uh, so. Growing up, my dad had this bookshelf, <laughs> like like all black bags. Like this a bookshelf that is like, and usually it's in the lounge or it's in the dining or something. There's like tons of books, and you have to dump yeah, it yeah, yeah, yeah. Like this book has not been over. I'm, I'm now 15. This book <laughs> I've never has, seen I've anyone, never seen reading, anyone reading, but it's there. And yeah. Don't you dare think you you distribute their books. Yeah. Yeah. So he had this bookshelf with all sorts of different books. Um, a lot of them were books that he collected when he went to Cuba. He went to Cuba like a lot of um, yeah. teachers from back that in the day. Yeah. 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 So there's a, a lot of books. He used to be a ma- mathematics teacher. So okay. there were some mathematics books, but there were also, you know, philosophy books. There were books on Spanish mm-hmm. because he had to learn Spanish when he was there. Mm-hmm. Um, there were books on chemistry and things like that. And as a kid, as a curious kid, you know, I guess I was also bored as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I would I would read those books. And there's a bit of a story to why I was I was a little bored. Why I'm saying I was bored is that there were a lot of times when I was just alone at home. I was yeah, I was, I was literally going to go into that. Say, do you think part of you you being bored was because one fine like you're saying you were at home alone for 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 a lot of times, but also. Do you think your introversion had something to do with it? That, you know, you were the kid who would rather not be outside, you know, playing mamchan and the rest and stuff with, with people, but would, you know, because you're an introvert and maybe you just enjoyed your own company, you prefer to, like, retreat. And then, as a you know, because now you're not with people, you have to kind of find something to fill your time and entertain you. It's, it, it's related to some extent. Yeah. And I say to some extent because... Uh, for me, it was a little odd in that I had I had a lot of friends okay. in primary school. Yeah, I was the sort of kid where you know on a random afternoon, my parents would come home yeah. and find like twenty kids yeah. in their in their living room. Yeah. Um. So I I don't know why I had a lot of friends because it's not like I was a very talkative whatever guy. Um. But I guess um I had things. Mm. So maybe that's. That's why okay. uh, when I say I had, well, not me personally, but at home, because I, I grew up, um, we're, we're not in a very well up place, Okay. but I think compared to, to uh, those that were in your community at that yeah, time. Yeah, we had a lot more things. So yeah. like, for example, um, you know, we had satellite TV mm-hmm. um, and we were one of the first people, at least that I knew who had satellite TV, like yeah. where we, where we lived. Um, at some point, you know, I was fascinated with a lot of things. I would get lots of like movies and stuff. Yeah. So I, I, at some point I had like, you know, TV, TV games. games. Uh-huh. Yeah. So the other boys would come at home and we'll be playing games uh-huh. or watching a movie or, or something like that. Yeah. Right. Um, but I, I think in general, I was kind of a popular kid in that way, which is why I'm saying it's odd is because I was introverted. You're introverted, but, but may- maybe you're introverted, but you're just likable in the people's person because i see it even now right Mm -hmm. like a lot of our friends who've met you now don't believe (laughs) us when we say you're an introvert because even in your introversion you just have an innate love for people and being around people and maybe it also came from your parents as as far as i know yeah yeah Yeah, yeah, about that that definitely came from i've got too many things to tell you about now (laughs) (laughs) um the the love of people definitely came from my parents uh because my parents have always been people who love people mm-hmm. um I've, I've told you many times that we grew up with lots of people in the house when i say that i don't mean like visitors i mean like my parents they would find um if there was someone who wasn't well off or, mm-hmm. or something like that they would bring them in and so these people we grew up together as my siblings you know 
Um, but anyway, back to the point I was making. I I love people in that sense. So I was always with lots of people like during school days and whatever, right? Yeah. But I still liked my time alone. Okay. So the reason I found myself alone so much at home was because I didn't like, um, you know, being around parties and things like that. So usually on weekends, you know, growing up on weekends, there was always something going on. Mm. Someone's getting married. Yeah. Or the birthday party yeah. somewhere and stuff like Especially that. Especially like us, right? We're yeah. like the, the houses are close together. Yeah. People would really live in communities. You yeah. always know what's going on in people's yeah. lives, you know. Yeah. Vis-a-vis the burbs where or you can it looks like there's something going on there, but I don't know what it is. I guess it's more mm-hmm. of like if someone is having something, it's mm-hmm. like a community bring everyone together type of Yeah, thing, yeah. And like thing. back then relatives were much closer to each yes. other. So whenever there was a thing going on with your relatives, you'd people, go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, even like your neighbors yeah. were kind of relatives in a sense. Yeah. So there's always something going on, you know. Um, but I didn't like those things. Okay. So, uh, and I had this reluctance, you know, I would go. I guess at some point my parents realized that even when I'm there, I'm not You're looking not there. happy or I'm not there and whatever. And so they started allowing me to just remain at home. Okay. So a lot of times when people would be at weddings, uh <laughs> Or, or stuff like that, I, I wouldn't be there. Yeah. Um, actually, there's something that I still feel bad about today. Uh, mm-hmm. I didn't go to Lungle's wedding, do you know? Yeah, really? Yeah. You just didn't want to be there? Yeah, because by the time Lungle... For, for, for context, Lungle is his sister, one of the people that his, his parents you know, like took in. Mm-hmm. But unlike others who like took in in the past, she really like became a part of the family and was literally like a sister. And even now... Um, you know, his uh, her her daughter is literally still in our lives as like a niece, a niece mm-hmm. of ours. Yeah. Yeah. So it had been she got married after you know I had been doing this thing of just staying of just at not home, going, yeah. of just not going yeah. to to weddings and stuff for for a while. So I was I was a kid, man. So I didn't like think about it too hard. Mm-hmm. It was just ah, another wedding. I'm not going to go. Yeah. Is is only you know later when I. I spoke to her and I saw the disappointment that mm. she had that I didn't come to her wedding. Yeah. She knew that I generally didn't go to weddings, but, but maybe she, she didn't expect for her, that, yeah. surely, you know, yeah. for my wedding. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I stay at home a, lo- a lot of the times. And because of this, um, I would be there. I read my dad's books. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I read a lot of chemistry, <laughs> um, to the extent that I started understanding some stuff. So when I started studying chemistry at high school, for mm. example, I was in blank. Mm. Like I understood a lot of the stuff because I had done it. Yeah. I My dad had this a book called Spanish Made, Made Simple. Mm-hmm. And I read that book cover to cover. I, I could understand Spanish at Can the time. Now? No, now it's, <laughs> most it's of it is gone. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I was I was generally curious. My dad also had this set of CDs and like mm. vinyl, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, records. Mm. So I listened to those things, man. I all the albums that she had, that he had, I I can probably still sing you them, word, them. Word, yeah. word for word okay. today. Okay. Um, my my parents would buy gadgets. Like I said, we were one of the first to have satellite TV, yeah. right? One time. My parents bought, what was it called? Vivid or something like that. Um, and on the first week, maybe first day, mm. after work, when they came back, I had opened the thing. <laughs> I don't know. I can't remember what I was. I opened the thing and I couldn't put it back together. Yeah. Um, and it died. Like, we, <laughs> it, yeah, on the first, very first week. And we're not well up. So that thing so cost them. You just a, replace it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So... Okay. Yeah, so that's where it's coming from. It's not like I was interested in reading. Okay. I was just curious, curious about, about life. Okay. Mm-hmm. So so fast forward, right now, you are a software developer, right? But mm-hmm. you, you taught yourself this. And I, I think maybe part of it is because your curiosity al- allowed you to get here. But I know that this software development thing, well, as, 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 a, as a craft, as an industry, it is something that you've come into in your adult years. But mm-hmm. I'm curious to know, when you think back now, thinking back at the things that you did before you became a software engineer, does it like make sense in your head that, you know what, I think I was always supposed to end up here. Like what, what is the, if, if you think back, what is the journey that has led you here to software 
so software development from from as far as, as you can remember i don't know if this is where I, um, it, i've ended up by the way okay okay <laughs> I might this is where you are now yeah <laughs> yeah um but yeah there's there's definitely a long line that i can trace that led yeah. me here so right now i was young again i don't know what my parents saw or maybe they were just uh planning for the future or something mm. like that but they enrolled me for computer lessons okay. and this was a time when like i said we grew up in a place that it's not well well up yeah. most it wasn't people the norm. Yeah, yeah yeah probably be, before my first lesson i i had never seen a computer mm-hmm. um um but there was a guy uh, in the neighborhood yeah. who used to work at academy of learning and he was a, a teacher there mm-hmm. computers teacher so he had a computer yeah. right which was quite something for someone to have his yeah, own his personal, own personal yeah, yeah yeah um and so he had recently started this thing where he's, he was offering to teach people mm-hmm. computers and my parents enrolled me for it that's actually that's actually an important thing because like you said you don't know what they saw but i think they they did see something right obviously mm-hmm. in their heads at, at that time it wasn't oh this guy is going to be a software developer right mm-hmm. but maybe your parents paid close enough attention to you mm-hmm. and they could see how curious you are mm-hmm. and maybe they figured out okay fine how can we channel this curiosity into something that will probably be helpful for him in the future mm-hmm. and and not just something that would be helpful in terms of something that's done by everyone but how can we knowing him and his interest and his curiosity mm-hmm. set him up for success in the future and mm-hmm. put him ahead of of the curve you mm-hmm. know of everyone else and so i think kudos to your parents because mm-hmm. to me that says they were they were present in their own way in like you know they, they knew you they could see you they knew you and so and so they they you know they they did what they could to set you up for for success and i think that's something beautiful and to, to emulate especially today just be present and if you can already see it in your child do what you can if they decide they don't like it it's fine but at least as a parent you can say i did what i could to like hone this interest and now look at look at what it's become yeah 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 for sure for sure i think that was that was really quite visionary yeah. um i've i've asked them mm-hmm. um but i didn't really get a i didn't get an impressive answer yeah <laughs> I, i don't know they uh maybe they didn't want to respond to me yeah. maybe i caught them at the wrong time but yeah. they didn't really have like a strong ah oh, we saw this and yeah. you know yeah 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 but it was it was it changed my life um to say the least because after that i'm the one who taught them how to I use computers do. um because which is an interesting thing right because they took me to these lessons to learn this thing that but they, they, also, they also didn't know yeah, yeah. Had, but they were like you know what so his future let's mm-hmm. just you know get him into it amazing yeah so i i taught them um at some point when i was still in school i was you know making a bit of cash fixing people's computers uh-huh. at some point you know when when we would rip music burning music yeah. cd's for people yeah. and and things like that right um at some point in university i was um writing programming assignments for oh, for, for people, people who were studying who that had, program yeah who were doing computer science because i wasn't um at work even when i was still a civil engineer mm-hmm. I you know at some point I made this proposal to build a, a system for managing like we had a, a drawing room yeah. right which has like drawings yeah. plans for yeah. all the infrastructure in the city mm-hmm. and because how it works is that other people from other departments from time to time mm-hmm. they would come to borrow these right yeah. for whatever work they're doing and there wasn't a good system to track where who has which who has drawing what, uh, and and whatever yeah cuz you record it in a book sometimes people would forget to do that and sometimes people would take long and of etc yeah so i made a proposal that i'm going to build a, a software system. system to to solve this mm-hmm. this is almost like a library system mm-hmm. right when people come they check out a drawing yeah. record who's who it's with blah 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 yeah so i i built that thing um at work so it, you can see i can see the, i up. can see the thread in the steps and then my question then becomes since you had been exposed to it at such a young age and you kind of knew or had an interest in it why then go the civil engineering route why didn't you just like go straight into that um i don't know man i well firstly i was 
curious about a lot of things that okay. I've already said. So it's not so like this like was this wasn't my only the interest. The, there were a lot of things I was doing. Okay. But I did have a hunch that I wanted to to study computers. And at the time, my uh, my father was in Ireland. Mm-hmm. And he was at Limerick University. I wanted to apply there to go and do computer engineering. And I did make the applications, but it was too expensive. We couldn't afford it. We tried this and that to try and afford it. But, you know, it didn't work out. We didn't manage to put the funds together. But I was a, you know, I was a kid at the time. I was really disappointed. Mm. And, um... I didn't. I I went to university a year later because for a while after that like, I no was one. just not interested yeah. in anything. Yeah, yeah, and even how I wound up in civil engineering, I didn't really choose it. Okay. So after high school, um, because I finished high school at a time when Zim things were really not great. Yeah. Um, that's a story for another <laughs> day. Um, and so lots of uh the people from our stream didn't go to university immediately. People were trying all sorts of different things. I mean, at the time, I applied to do accounting at EY. I, I you, just, you just needed someone to give you a break. You just needed something, right? There wasn't... I imagine at that time, there wasn't a lot of room for passion and, and all of that. It was like, what can we do to to help ourselves and the family with the situation that we're in? Yeah, yeah, 100%. And I, the other thing that was problematic is... I was I was good at everything. Ah. You know, it's much easier to choose after high school and say I'm going to do this at university if you know you Just were secure. good at numbers yeah. or you were really good at biology or something, yeah. right? I was good at a lot of things and I liked a lot of things. Mm-hmm. I was curious about a lot of things. So, you know, uh it was hard for me to say this is what I want. It felt like too big of a commitment. This is what I want to do for the rest of my life, yeah. you know? Yes. I, I, I agree. I, I really think 18 is so young to yeah. be an age where you're supposed to decide what you're going to do for the rest yeah. of your life. Especially for, for a lot of black people who do not have generational wealth, that kind of will allow us to, you know, do, do this thing, I mean. fail, or feel like we don't feel like it, and then start another thing from scratch mm-hmm. again. Mm-hmm. Because for a lot of us, you at 18, 19, you choose what you're supposed to do. As soon as you're done with that thing, there's no buffer or time to like chill and figure out what 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 to actually do with my life. Mm-hmm. As soon as you're done, there are responsibilities. You now need to plow back into mm-hmm. the community. So mm-hmm. you have to throw yourself into work mm-hmm. and start working in that field that maybe you've realized is not for you. Mm-hmm. But you have to because, you know, the mm-hmm. bills, black text, whatever. Mm-hmm. And before you know it, you've spent 10 years doing that mm-hmm. thing that you hate mm-hmm. and you still hate it. Mm-hmm. But you, you can't imagine a different life because changing now is actually harder than it was like mm-hmm. straight after uni because mm-hmm. I've done this for 10 years. Where would I even start? Mm-hmm. Who would, like who would give me a chance? So yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I get that. Mm-hmm. I get that. Yeah, so it was it was really difficult. And I was I was saying this to explain how I ended up in civil engineering. So one of my friends was in South Africa at the yeah. time and I was applying at NAST, which is the local university yeah. where we were. Um no, I wasn't applying. He asked me to submit his application okay. to us. So I did like his whole application. And I was like, I might as well just apply mm-hmm. at the same university as well. Um, no, actually, <laughs> the story is a little different. I had, you, you know, right after after high school, you apply to a lot of universities. I had applied to NAS. Okay. And I had started at NAS. A, a, pro, a different program that's not civil engineering. Yes, I okay. did. I did applied physics for a year, okay. and I hated it. <laughs> um, I hated it mostly because it was difficult. It uh. was incredibly difficult because uh, it's theoretical physics, man, and it's like you know already first year you are doing too much, <laughs> and there's lab as well. Yeah. You go and do this experience. You have to do like lab reports every week. You've got lab reports. First semester is like one a week. Second semester is now two a week. It's it's it was it was a lot, and I didn't like it. Um, and so this whole time, a friend of mine, Cedric, mm. we were in the same program. We were bothering the the engineering dean yeah. to let us switch to to engineering. Yeah. At the time, I, I we we're trying to get into electronic engineering. Yeah. Right. We just wanted some. You just you some, just wanted to get away yes, from this guy. Exactly. Um, and so. We were working at this, right? Mm. And I remember 
we I, I remember saying to Cedric that you know what uh, I I I I'd probably watched something or read something mm. and I say to him uh we've done this of course and these guys are saying no but let's bother these guys and, yeah. until they say yes right we're going to go today he'll say no tomorrow we're back he'll say no and that's what we did literally we were at this guy's office every single day even though he said no yesterday yeah. tomorrow we're back yeah. um and then whilst we were doing this so the other friend who's in SA mm-hmm. asked me to make an application for him okay cuz he had he hadn't started with us he had tried to try you know to do something mm-hmm. in south africa but he figured you know let me go to school so i made the application for him and when i was doing it i was like ah, i may as well apply for, for myself yeah, as well yeah. so i reapplied to the university reapplied to this program mm-hmm. um and then how i chose civil engineering is because he had told me to choose civil engineering for him, for him when he was applying okay. i was like ah, i might as well apply for the same thing i didn't even know what civil engineering was at the time or what it was about um but we were ac- we were both accepted okay so and we moved to civil engineering yeah and cedric kept bothering the guy uh-huh. until the guy said yes so we started together together yeah ah amazing and then obviously you go through the degree you figure out what it's about mm-hmm. and then this you sort of like it long enough to stay in it for a couple of years and graduate and mm-hmm. and all that and then you find yourself in industry mm-hmm. actually now in the because sometimes the the picture the idea that we have of the industry we're going to mm-hmm. uh from career days and what we mm-hmm. learn mm-hmm. can turn out to be a bit different from what you experienced mm-hmm. but then so you find yourself now in the in the field of civil engineering and mm-hmm. you know you've been doing it for a while at what point are you like no man this is not it or, or was it gradual or even by the time you got there you knew that mm, you know because yeah. sometimes even during uni you're like this this thing, <laughs> this thing is not for me but yeah. especially maybe in your case you already did physics for one year and and left and did something else Mm-hmm. Can you imagine like going back to your parents and be like actually that other thing that I did <laughs> physics for is not working out again. Yeah. So at what point in your journey as a civil engineer are you like you know what? Mm-hmm. This is this is not it. Um just to comment before I answer your question directly. I think one thing that gave me the remit to do all of these things is that uh my my parents weren't too um you know really deeply involved in Meeting. what i was doing at school blah 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 right it's like are you at school like, so. sure you know <laughs> um and i don't know if they trusted me or they were irresponsible well spring of both and cuz you were first born also so they were kind of doing this for the first time and we always say that you know our parents are are, are, are growing they're as they is yeah, they're figuring out themselves well. out as they try to figure out how to parent us as well mm-hmm. so yeah so i I didn't have to explain a lot of things to my parents when I was switching to physics I just did it. Yeah. You know, maybe I didn't even tell maybe I told them afterwards that ah, I'm now doing this, yeah. right? Um so I had the liberty to to make all of Maneuver. these changes without needing to explain to somebody, which mm-hmm. I guess was was a little helpful. So anyway, I I got into civil engineering in the in my second year I got in I got a bursary from the local city council okay. which is another story as well because <laughs> initially I didn't want to apply for this when I was going to submit for someone else the person I was submitting to was like why why, why aren't you, you like apply <laughs> yeah. you know and that's how I ended up applying ended up getting it but like I said story for another day anyway I started I did civil engineering I was now working at the council mm-hmm. who were getting paid a lot of money for the time and that kind of fuel because it was exciting where are these no, kids no, making money and you're coming from a community where you know money goes a long way right yeah. and it wasn't just that oh i know a few extra bucks on top mm-hmm. of the mini bucks that i already mm-hmm. have it was mm-hmm. probably like really life changing right? yeah for sure for sure it was life changing money and also besides the money yeah. there was the excitement that where these kids are there at the council offices just oh, going around were, well, you know the future engineers <laughs> yeah. right yeah. everyone put that respect on us yeah. because um at the council engineers were like the, the people yeah. right yeah. and we are poised up to be the engineers of tomorrow mm-hmm. so you know it was it was nice it was quite an experience and because we weren't like tied to any particular project we were just hovering yeah. it was it was a place and to I, hang I guess out. the stakes are low right yeah it was you're not a full engineer is yet so like mm-hmm. 
you don't have the responsibility of actually making sure that the programs mm-hmm. work but mm-hmm. but you're doing it also but yeah, there's, there's, there's yeah. a bit of ah, you know? yeah so it was it was quite exciting i would say that the entire time when we were still students mm. and working at the council at the same time i i really enjoyed it um i it, at that point it didn't hit me that ah maybe this thing okay. for me because there was there was more excitement yeah. than Actual maybe it was the end of my final year i'm not sure yeah but when i was actually working at the council after we're done at nas ah man <laughs> the the work was exciting it was nice like when you're in, in the middle of doing it it's exciting it's challenging you're solving all of these problems but I, I, when i wake up in the morning and i'm going to work i'm like ah not again man you know yeah, i won't i won't speak too much but you know you know i can relate with this yeah. feeling i've i've been there i know the thing mm-hmm. where like it's not like every single moment or minute spent at work is so dreadful, mm-hmm. right? Like sometimes I really get something exciting to do and I'm like, oh, this is fun. Mm-hmm. I'm learning. And when you do something and you see the final product and you're mm-hmm. like, oh, wow, I did that, right? It's exciting. Mm-hmm. But like in the grand scheme of things, mm-hmm. all things considered, mm-hmm. you're like, oh. mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, you know, I would wake up in the morning. I'm not fired up about mm-hmm. what I'm doing. And... I'm just I'm just someone who's curious about a lot of things. Um I'm easy about jumping ship, <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah. Um probably because I don't have to explain many things to my parents. Yeah. Um so but anyway, I I didn't like going out and working working out in the sun. In the, okay. You know? And that's a big part of civil Yeah, engineering. it's a part of the yeah. job. I liked being in the office. Um but even whilst I was there because I was still doing some software software things yeah. by the computer things by the side i remember i was working in the strategic planning department and i was introducing some some things from software engineering within the department just to help things be better okay um i did this project the drawing one that i told you about and eventually because i i was always innovating in this way when the council was introducing like a GIS department. Um, they wanted people to volunteer for mm-hmm. it. So initially when they were introducing this, they selected some people to go and do the training for this thing. Okay. I wasn't one of the people selected uh-huh. to do the training. Um, I don't know why. Yeah. Maybe I was absent when they were people were volunteering or whatever. Yeah. I wasn't yeah. part of it. But the people who went to do, some of them didn't they really fell out. They didn't really connect with it. So, but anyway, I was... I liked it and I was always hanging around with these guys. I'm like, what is this GIS thing? So I started, I'm naturally curious, yeah. started, you know, researching on YouTube, watching videos, learning about this GIS thing mm. and hanging out in the GIS department. Uh, until at some point, I, I, I started being the go-to the guy. guy, you because know? Because of your curiosity and your, mm-hmm. your, your hunger for, for knowledge and learning, mm-hmm. you, were, you were now doing more than... The people that it was you that know, actually some, did the training, yeah, who did the training, and the people whose whose job it was <laughs> to to know these things. Mm-hmm. I think that speaks a lot to you know what diligence and, and hard work and just mm-hmm. pushing yourself out there, you know, mm-hmm. can can do for you. It can open doors and put you in rooms where you know you were you were not meant to be or you're not even qualified. But mm-hmm. if you've got the skills, if you've got if, if if you clearly you know deserve opportunities, you know you will mm-hmm. get them. You mm-hmm. know, yeah, and I think the other thing that attracted me to GIS was the fact that I'm in in front in of the, the computer most yeah, of it. Yeah. It did have some no field. Sun. Yeah, it did have some field work where I have to get out in the sun and whatever, right? But I I, I guess because it was a new thing, mm-hmm. right? Similar to when I was studying at the council, I, I get excited about new things. Um I could for look past the mm. thing that I've, I've got in the sun. Because also I'm collecting data that I have to go back in the office yeah. and work with and it was exciting. Um, so I did that until eventually I was allowed to move to the GIS department. Um, and you know, I was given charge of a, a section of it. And at that point, at that point, you know what? I was just doing what I want. Mm-hmm. I was now going to work to literally do what I feel like doing. Mm-hmm. And it, work was nice again. Um, and at some point, um, 
because Lai City Council had been the first to really build up their GIS department mm -hmm. in the country, um, we when other councils wanted to do the same thing, they they got us to to help to help, to help mm -hmm. out, mm -hmm. right? So there was this there were these um, NGOs, primarily GIZ, it was a, a German one, um, wanted people to help out with those councils. And, you know, I was now uh, selected as one of the consultants. Yeah. Um, and so a big part of my final years at the council, we were out, we'd travel to Harare, be spending, you know, living two weeks in a hotel, we're getting these big stipends. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, making some extra money on the side, making forming some connections, which was really nice. Um, there's a, a thing about this GIS thing, um, actually. Because uh, when the GIS started and I was getting interested in yeah. it, yeah. this I was still final year. So, you know, my timeline is, is a little off. It's been a long time. I was still final year at, at NAS. Okay. Because my my final year project... Was was it had something to do with okay. GIS. So when I was there, uh, there was a, an Esri conference. So Esri is a GIS company. They make probably have the biggest market mm -hmm. share in GIS in the world. And there was a conference in Harare mm -hmm. um, for, you know, Esri users. And I wanted to go to that conference, but I didn't have the money. I was broke, yeah. right? Um, because in my mind, I was like, I will go to this conference. I will meet some people network. It will open up opportunities yeah. for me for the future. Um, so uh, I had a car. I went uh, to pick up some people, hitchhikers, yeah. right? Pick them up. Mm -hmm. They paid, fueled the car, went, drove to Arar. Mm -hmm. And I got there. I didn't have a place to stay mm -hmm. even. I went to use it when was. Yeah. Um, we're figuring out where am I going to sleep, where am I going to sleep. At some point, we had agreed that I will sleep at my uh, ex-girlfriend's place because she was also said use it. But mm -hmm. fortunately, one of my aunts, um, you know, we found her and then I ended up going to sleep there. Mm -hmm. So I attended this conference. Yeah. And in this conference, there was somebody named Marius Berger. I remember his name. Mm -hmm. I spoke to him. He was from Esri, South Africa. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm interested in this thing. I want to learn. Can you give me advice and whatever? And he was like, I, you know what? We work a lot with the University of Pretoria. Mm -hmm. um, so I can connect you to them. So he gave me contacts to someone called Serena mm -hmm. Kotsia mm -hmm. um, from UP. Yeah. And when I came back, uh, coming back again, I picked up some people from the government. Yeah. When I came back, I emailed Serena and told her, I'm interested in GIS. I would like to do it one day, blah, blah, blah. How do I get there? And Serena told me, yeah, I mean, you know, do this and this and this and this and this. And where this is going is that eventually I went to University of Pretoria um, to do a master's in geoinformatics. Mm -hmm. And Serena was the head of department there. She, she couldn't remember me at the, the time. The power of networking. Yeah, you, networking. Know? Yeah. you know, you know. Um, she couldn't remember that she had even spoken to me yeah. or whatever, but I, I eventually got in there. Mm. I can't say I had this grand vision that I will follow this plan and actually got there, but I, I tried it out and it eventually panned out. Yeah. Right? Anyway, so yeah, that that was how GIS grew yeah. and I got known as a GIS guy, not just at Blair City Council, but in the country. Yeah, and then interestingly... Because I know your story personally, you know I'll be, I'll be, I'm, I'm connecting dots also in my head. And from that Esri conference that you attended, where you had to make ends meet to, 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 to you know, to get there, you ended up actually working at Esri mm -hmm. uh, in South Africa, and that yeah. is, you know, a, a, a chain of events that you know put yourself out there. You, you don't know where, where it's going to end up. Mm -hmm. I, I, even, even the Bible does say in Ecclesiastes that you know, sow your seed in the in the summer and the winter and the whatever. For you know not which of your seeds is going to germinate and bring forth mm -hmm. fruit, right? Mm -hmm. So if you see an opportunity and you are, you know, remotely interested in it, even if you can't see in the bigger picture how this could play out for you, I see in, in your story that, you know, by seizing every opportunity you get and giving it your best shot, you could actually open up doors for yourself in the future that your future self will thank you for, right? Mm -hmm. And so anyway, you end up at, at Esri, you end up working there, and then somewhere along the line again, you figure out, let me do something a bit different, and this is software development, this is what you're doing now. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm 
the, the journey is fine, but I'm I'm so interested in how in the self taught part element of it because that that's mm-hmm. for me something that blows your blows my mind so much because right now you're a senior software engineer, mm-hmm. but you're self taught like. Mm-hmm. You don't have a degree or a certification or even a diploma that you mm-hmm. can show someone and be like, "Here it is." And in the, in the in a world where like you know accolades are everything, you have shown that by putting in the work and you can make something of yourself. Just tell me about your your self teaching journey and and how that plays out in day to day life, especially when you're in rooms with people who did this for like mm-hmm. four years or whatever. Yeah, cool. Before I answer your question, I I I'm I'm reflecting and I think I was quite. A little bit of a dreamer. Mm. If you remember when we met, right? At some point, I I made you <laughs> uh, write this Trello board. <laughs> you know about our you goals, did, yeah. right? And one of the goals I had at the time was one day I want to work at Esri. Mm. At the time, it was just a dream. It was so far fetched, yeah. Right? <laughs> but it actually happened. Yeah. And I can't even say that at the time I was writing this. Mm. I had a solid plan. This is how I would get there. It it happened serendipitously, yeah. right? Because I was just following my passion and stuff. Interestingly, I think it still continues along the thread of curiosity, mm-hmm. right? Because I had been, you know, doing. The, the, the GIS itself had some elements of software engineering, and I, I still had a small interest in software development yeah. Yeah. by the side, right? But when I moved to South Africa, because that was the thing I had studied and I, I needed to kind of make my place, I went back to civil engineering. And I was working as a civil engineer in this job that I really didn't like. Yeah. Um, and then one day I kept applying. One day I got this job via, you know, the tax career network this job it was a gis job at ram Mm -hmm. and when i was at ram something interesting happened again there was a pro it wasn't a problem but there was an inefficiency in their systems i saw it i did the research similar to like the drawing thing Mm -hmm. did the research for how we could make this better it was something that i I didn't know about so i had to learn right um so learned figured out how we could make it better, wrote a proposal, mm. presented it to the director of the company. Yeah. And he loved it. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. You can do this thing, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and essentially moved me from the department I was and was like, now you're going to report directly to mm-hmm. me. Mm-hmm. But he's the director, is often not yeah. the... So yeah, the guy. Yeah. So now I'm again, similar to what it was with, with G- the GIS department. I'm now going to work and doing whatever I want, mm. Right. And that's the time when I really learned um, like s- software development. Mm-hmm. Um, I spent all my time writing these Python scripts to help people in the GIS department like make their tasks more efficient. Mm-hmm. I spent some time learning Node.js, you know, it's like a backend program yeah. uh, to solve the thing that I had proposed. I was basically being paid to do what I want to do, yeah. to learn, mm-hmm. right? And of in my entire career, that is where I learned the, the most. most. And and then you finally got your prop first like proper engineering, you know, software, software engineering. engineering. Mm-hmm. And how is that process of you know when you thought let me apply for a role that says software engineer and you technically are not one? What was going through your mind? Um, it was a software transition. Then yes, when I was at RAM and doing all of this stuff for for Lindsay, I I honestly I could see. That yeah. the perception that Lindsay has of my skill is exactly. much higher than <laughs> what the so skills skilled. actually yeah. are. But I knew enough to fake my way, mm. right? Because I was working with another guy, Reynard, who was, you know, he had a master's mm. in computer science and he really knew his things, right? Mm. Reynard could probably see that eh, this guy is lacking, but he was a good guy. Yeah. We worked together and figured things out. Um, but I've always been someone who is not afraid to be, to, to just... Put yourself get, out there. Put myself What's out the worst there. that could happen, right? Yeah, it's like you it's know? an application. They will just and at say this point, we'll to inform you and then you won't Yeah, work. at this point when I was transitioning to, to software, um, I had that fear, right? Because most of, most people would have this fear that what if it doesn't work out? I'm living a good career and mm. whatever, right? But the way I went past that was if this fails, I just go, go back, back to civil engineering. So when I fall, I'm not falling to, to zero. The, yeah. You know, I've, I've already have a, a high baseline that i'm falling to so let me just give it a shot uh-huh. whatever right um so when i applied to esri yeah the job was not 
software engineer. It was GIS mm. GIS developer. It was still a software engineering okay. job, but okay. GIS software and en- mm-hmm. software development. So I applied for the job. I prepped so much for that interview, man. It's one of those interviews that I really prepped so much that mm-hmm. every answer they were just throwing us, just yeah. every question they were throwing us, just the answer was there. on it. Yeah. yeah, you know when the interview is going and you're like, this interview is going, going well. well. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and then yeah. afterwards, the guys themselves were like, ah, you, don't, you have nothing to worry about. Okay. You did well. Um, to the extent that they, they went to speak with the HR lady. Mm-hmm. And before I left, as I was leaving, she came mm-hmm. and was like, ah, okay, so this is, uh, you, how, how much do you want? Okay. Right? Uh-huh. Um, and I'm like, I want this much. They're like, no, actually, but this is what the job has, the budget for the job. Mm-hmm. I'm like, ah. Would you consider it? I'm like, I'm not sure. But now she didn't want me to leave without mm. like saying out. And so she, Kept we negotiated yeah. the salary right there. By the time I left, because I was like, if she's negotiating the salary with yeah. me, surely they won't then call me up and say, ah, no, we're actually not taking. So when I left, I was confident that I got okay. the job. Um, I did really still feel out of my depth. Yeah. Because... I, I passed the interview because I prepped really well. Not mm-hmm. because I not because you, I knew the yeah, thing. Yeah, you knew really the well. thing, yeah. But yeah, when you yeah. get to the job, you have to do the thing, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. Um, but because uh, I'd always been curious, avid learner and stuff like mm. that, I had the confidence that whatever they give to me, I may not know it, but I'll you sit can down learn and it. learn it. Yeah. Right? And that's how I've gotten through uh, imposter syndrome. Mm. Because I tell myself I, yeah, that yeah. I don't know. Um, I'm, I, they, I might get discovered, but... If I put my head down and learn, I might, I can fake it long mm. enough. And uh, I mean, if, to if, not be discovered. You know, the interesting thing about imposter syndrome is that you, you, you usually have like a long chain of evidence that says mm-hmm. you deserve to be here. It's not by chance. Mm-hmm. You've earned your spot here, but mm-hmm. still it creeps up on you. And so I think it's an important thing that you're saying that, you know, you struggle with it, with it but you, how you navigate it is by saying, yeah, right now I'm feeling like one because I don't know how to do this, mm-hmm. but I can learn. I can learn. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. and then I won't be an imposter. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I can yeah. learn. I can yeah. learn. Um, and, and, and and so how how's that? How's it going right now? Because now you're even a senior, so it's different from when you just you can sort of like lean yeah. on other people. But now yeah. you're kind of expected to to know a lot of stuff. Yeah. Um. So how do you, how do you navigate that, especially as a senior? That that you know, in terms of you know learning it, so I don't feel like an imposter. Mm-hmm. The senior thing actually started after. <laughs> Um, the Esri job. Yeah. The job at Sigma with Paul. Yeah. So when I was at, I was at Esri, um, barely like three months into the job at Esri, I, you know, I, was, I kept applying for mm. jobs because I felt like I need to grow fast. Yeah. Remember when I left civil engineering, I was now a little bit yeah. senior. Yeah, so and now I had to start from the, the and I, I wanted to rise yeah. quickly. And I figured, you know, the best way to grow is just to keep jumping sheep, yeah. right? Yeah. And so uh, I kept applying for jobs and I somehow stumbled upon this job from Paul, the Sigma thing. I sp- we spoke with Paul on the phone whilst I was at Esri. Yeah. Uh, during lunchtime, I remember we had I'm the sure first interview. Doing that. <laughs> uh, first interview, I was in the cafeteria. Yeah. Um, and then the next interview, which was a coding interview, I was actually in my, you did with an off- open plan yeah. office. I was at my desk in my cubicle there yeah. doing the coding yeah, interview. Okay. And I had built this this thing. I again, it's not like I was a brilliant engineer, but I prepared so much for that interview that I I wowed him. Yeah. And the thing I negotiated for was like, you know what? I figured if I negotiate for the for the title, yes, the designation, the, the, the rest is yeah. The pay can follow. If the pay doesn't follow, yeah, wherever I go next, I go next. I'm, I'm, I'm already a senior. senior. Yeah, exactly. So I negotiated with Paul that I'll be a senior um, developer, and so he hired me as a senior at it's at Sigma, mm-hmm. right? I didn't know a lot, but now I had the pressure, right? Because I now have people who look up to me and I put my head down mm-hmm. again and was like, I'm going to learn this thing. And I was learning. I really enjoyed it. Of all my jobs in software engineering, Sigma was really nice. Yeah. Um, everyone who's worked at Sigma will tell you that Sigma was really nice. There are just problems like every place, but Sigma was a really nice place to work. And I was learning a lot from people who were senior to me. I had juniors who are still friends to this day, Neil, Guide, mm. you know, and them. And uh, yeah, so I put my work, my head down again. 
and just learned. Mm-hmm. Um, and by after that, I went to Anaplan where I was not a senior, uh, but I, I knew a lot at this time. And so because I was in a job that was not a senior job, I was pretty comfortable. I was just sailing through, yeah. right? And then I moved to Contentful where I am right yeah. now. And, you know, I applied for a senior job. I got the senior job. But now uh, the pressure was on. Mm. And I'm like, ah, now I need to deliver at the senior level. So it's been a lot of pressure right now because I my rise was too fast. Mm. And so now, uh, especially last year, I had put myself where I need to sit down, slow down, yeah. and actually learn. To be at the so that m- the, my level of knowledge matches my designation. Yeah, because you know we spoke about you know sometimes you have to fake it, but you can't fake it forever, forever right? Yeah. Like you, you fake it as you buy yourself time to actually gain the skills and learn the knowledge that you you, you need to learn, right? Because mm-hmm. if people have taken a bet on you, the mm-hmm. least you can do is show up the hundred percent and mm-hmm. and do your best and mm-hmm. like measure up, such so that even when you have the conversation, you even you can see the trajectory of your growth and you can be mm-hmm. like, yeah, I, I admit when I started, I was a bit shaky. Mm-hmm. But look at the work that I've put in now mm-hmm. and you, you can be confident in that, you know, you made a good decision when, mm-hmm. when you bet on mm-hmm. me. So yeah, I think it's important that faking it can't be, you can't fake, it can't be your, 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 your stance forever. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for you sure. And I mean, one thing, if you look at my entire progression, one thing I, I have mastered is how to interview well. Yeah. Prepare well for an interview and get the job. Yeah. And even right now at Content for I could have continued and like applied again, got the next job yeah. because I can prepare really well for an interview. But I had to sit myself down and say, no, at some point, you know, it, yeah. if you keep rising like this, you'll be discovered mm. <laughs> at yeah. some point. Amazing. So I, I told myself, slow down, take the time at Content for learn, get, get your skills to where your mm-hmm. designation is. And that's why right now I'm like, I'm, I'm at Content for mm-hmm. I'm, I'm content. You happy? I'm happy. It's a you're, good job. A good it's a good place to work. Yeah. So I'm like, and there's you know, um, room to room grow. Room to grow. Yeah. So I was like, yeah, stay here, learn, grow, um, and figure yourself out. So yeah. that by the time you move, now you know your level, yeah. your knowledge is at your destination. Yeah. Uh, and you are you're comfortable there. Mm-hmm. So that's 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 where I am now. Yeah. I, I, I'm learning a lot at Contentful. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of brilliant engineers and I, I think I'm, I'm performing well for my level. Mm-hmm. And like I said, there's room room to grow. Yeah. And I've, I'm at a place in my life where I've been like, slow down. Yeah. Amazing. Um, learn and yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's so amazing. Thank you so much for, you know, sharing, sharing your story. And I know we've mm-hmm. been like dropping gems all along the way, but like, if you, if what do you have to say to someone who is at that place you're at, not at the JS level because you're excited about that, but you remember that time when you'd wake up in the morning and you're like, well, I really don't want to be doing this. This this is not how I want to spend the rest of my life. And maybe they even have even figured out what it is that they want to do, but they just don't know how to get there. Like, what is the one piece of advice that you would you know, give them navigating that space of, I, I know what I should be doing. I know where I want to go, but I just don't know. How to mm-hmm. get there? Mm-hmm. Um, because I'll say this quickly. Uh, I wrote about this. If someone wants to read about it, yeah. right? But I, I think I will. I will link. You know his his blog. Check it out. It's really fascinating. He writes a, a, about a, a lot of things. You know, life, relationships, finances, learning. So even tech. So it's a very interesting blog. If you're if you're an avid reader, um, I'll, I'll link it down below. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think the the first thing is to wherever you are, discover what, figure out what skills you have that mm. are transferable. Yes. Right? Um, because you may not like what you're doing, but there's things in, in there that you enjoy. That you enjoy and there's skills that you can transfer to something else. Yeah. And figure out how you can already start using those skills whilst you're there, before you move out. Okay. Right? If you, if you look at my life, the way I would transition in all the time was, I wouldn't first jump ship. Mm, I would mm-hmm. first start doing the thing. So that by the, the time the, you jump ship, you can be like, look, I've, I have been doing it, even if it was in a different yes, format. Yes, okay. exactly. So the reason you want to do this is you want to build up some sort of a portfolio mm. so that when you move, you may not have the qualification or whatever like everyone else, you but can you, you can demonstrate that I can do this. Mm. And my story has always been, um, when, you, when you're getting me, right, I'm not like 
you know, say I want to move to accounting. Mm. I'm not like all the accountants that you've spoken to. Mm. I'm an accountant who's been a civil engineer, who's been a software engineer, who's been a GIS engineer. So I've got this wealth okay. of knowledge across industries. That's that should play better yeah. for you. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so it means the my my opinion, my thoughts that you're going to get are, are, are diverse, mm. you know, and they 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 are richer than what you'd get from somebody who followed the the straight path to yeah. the to the career. So do that, figure out the skills, start doing the thing so that you build up a portfolio. And having done that, figure out the story that you're going to use to sell to yourself, sell yourself, right? Because, um, like I said, I learned to be good at, at interviews. And one key with interviews is you need to have a story yes. that, is, that sets you that apart. Sell. That yes. sells and sets you mm-hmm. apart. Yeah. Where afterwards the the interviewers are going to have a good feeling about yeah. about you. They may not be able to pinpoint what, what exactly, yeah. but they it's should like leave the interview with a good feeling, something guy. about that yeah. guy. You know, so that they, they keep calling you back. Yeah. Right? And a key to that is to have a story that people will listen to and yeah. think, huh, you know, there's there's something to this yeah. guy. And so figure out your your unique selling point. Um and Keep, keep developing that. Yeah. So for me, I advocate for a slow transition. It's, you know, don't just leave your job and say, I'm, I'm now going to start from zero and whatever. Make a, a slow transition yeah. and first prove. Because sometimes you think you want to do something else, but you're going to hate that other thing as much as you hate this thing that you're doing right mm. now. Yeah. But uh, if, like I said, I wrote about it. So. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you for, for sparing your time. And like I said at the start of this episode, the whole point is that I hope in the in this conversation that I have with, you know, these incredible people, you can relate and you can see yourself in them. And bigger than that, you can see your future self in them based on you know how they've managed to, to navigate life. So thank you for sticking around and thank you for coming on my show. And I think it was not my show. And thank you for coming to have a chat with me. Um, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I do. And um, especially because I'm, my destiny is tied to yours, I really wish you the best. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope you continue to grow and do better and better and, and are fulfilled in your, in your life. Good one. Thank you. High five. <laughs> All right. Thank you for sticking around. I hope you really enjoyed this. If you did, please like you know, this episode and please share it with your friends and family. Also, you can find us on, you know, uh, podcasting platforms. So you can find us on on podcasts. You can find us on Spotify as well. Um, If you enjoyed it as well, just leave me a comment in the section. If you have any question that you have for BK, especially if you're in the same field and are looking to transition, please um, feel free to leave your question in the comment section. Otherwise, thank you as always, and I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye.